My Everyday Carry, this week on Mail Call Mondays. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. We're here on another Mondays, and I'm going to apologize to you guys in advance. I'm battling some kind of sinus infection, so um, if I look a little bit out of character, uh, that's why. If I sound a little bit stuffy on the mic, then um, that's why also, and I apologize for that, but I definitely wanted to get this show out for you. Now, we are doing some other stuff with the Mega Arms Ma 10 buildup, and we've got some other reviews coming out. In fact, I've got the KRG X-Ray sitting back there waiting for its turn uh, to finalize its review video. So we've got a few things uh, moving and shaking here. And I wanted to answer a question that I've received quite a few times uh, through various different channels for Mail Call Mondays, and that's, what do I carry when I go out and about? What is my everyday carry? Now, some of you guys remember that I'm a law enforcement officer from my regular uh, paid gig. That's what I do to actually pay the bills and uh, have insurance and whatnot for my family. And of course, the YouTube thing is uh, a great uh, part-time job that actually realistically fills most of my time. Uh, but we're not going to talk about what I strap on when I go to work right now. If you guys really want to know about what I carry at work uh, in my uniform job, uh, then go ahead and post a question in the comments down below or send it to us on Facebook, and we'll consider doing a video on the stuff I actually take to work. Uh, what I'm going to cover here is what I carry in my off-duty time. Uh, when I'm just out with my family, when I'm out running errands, uh, what I take with me to keep myself and to keep my family safe. Now this is not limited to a law enforcement aspect because I highly believe that any private citizen, wherever it's legal to do so, should be able to carry a weapon. I wish it was legal to do so everywhere because honestly, I believe that law-abiding citizens that are in the interest of keeping their own safety are not a threat to law enforcement in any way, shape, or form, and criminals are going to carry weapons whether it's legal or not. Now what we've got here from my right to my left are varying levels of handguns that I'll carry. I don't generally carry a long gun. If it's a situation where I think I'm going to need a long gun, uh, then we're talking a whole different ball game there. It's probably not somewhere I'm going uh, in my own uh, daily routine. It's probably not somewhere I'm going off duty. It's probably in an on duty capacity, and I'm going to armor up and load up with extra mags and all that fun stuff. Uh, for just my regular daily stuff, I find that a handgun is sufficient, of course, unless I'm going to the range and doing long gun stuff, or if I'm going out into the field. If I'm going well away from any occupied area, then I may throw a long gun in the trunk just because. But as far as handguns, we're going to start down here on the right. Uh, one thing that I pretty much can't live without is my cell phone. Uh, this is an iPhone 6 Plus. Uh, you can go back and forth on if you're Apple fans or Android fans or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter what phone you carry, whatever fills your need. But the main thing is you need a form of communication. In my opinion, a phone is critical, and we as a society have gotten to the point now, uh, most of us as adults, when we leave the house without some type of cell phone, uh, we pretty much feel naked. I know that's the way I feel. I'm sure quite a few of you feel that way as well. Um, got these kind of out of order here, but next up from the cell phone uh, is a pocket knife. I pretty much carry a pocket knife everywhere I possibly go, with the exception of on domestic airline flights, which, of course, will not allow you to carry a lock blade. Uh, they've gone back and forth on small non-locking knives. I have not checked right before we started this show because TSA keeps changing their stuff around here, there, and everywhere. At this point, I don't know if you are legally able to carry a non-locking small folding knife on domestic airline flights. Uh, however, if you could now or you couldn't now, it really doesn't matter because uh, the winds may change tomorrow and uh, they may change that rule on you. So always check before you fly. But anywhere else, I like to carry a blade on me of some type. Uh, usually a lock blade because a lock blade is a whole lot better if you have to press it in to work as a defensive blade. Um, if not, 
I just prefer lock blades because I don't have to worry about that blade closing up on my fingers if I bump it backwards or do something that I probably should not have done with a blade to begin with. Uh, this is a Benchmade Pardue 520. Uh, it is a really, really nice knife. Now, it's not something that I would take out into the backwoods because the blade is a little bit thin. Um, this is 154 cm blade steel, and what I found with this and the blade profile and the Benchmade, uh, the blade is really, really sharp. It cuts really well, but it does not take a lot of abuse, so impacts will tend to chip the edge because we have a really fine blade on this, uh, or a fine edge on this blade. So it's not a really good backcountry knife. Uh, the blade steel won't take a ton of abuse, but it is a really, really nice urban knife because it's very sharp. Uh, it's pretty small as far as defensive type knives go, so it really doesn't raise eyebrows if you take it out and you have to use it in public. Uh, it's got a nice belt clip on it, and the belt clip allows it to ride relatively low, so just the last quarter inch of the knife sticks up. Uh, it's got this nice machined aluminum handle on it, and the handle actually has, uh, they're almost like serrations, and these actually go down on the top side of the knife here. So when you grab it, when you slide that thumb inside your pocket to grab it and unclip it, the serrations work to grip the pad of your thumb really, really well. Uh, this knife has got, is starting to wear the coating off of the anodizing off the outside of the scales. Uh, it's been with me for quite a bit of time. I really, really like this knife. I carry something different when I'm working, but when I'm not working, this is pretty much always in my pocket. Again, check your local laws because there are some locales where this blade may be too large to legally carry, uh, but if that were the case, they do make a smaller version of this knife, and again, it's a Benchmade 520. Uh, they make a slightly smaller version, exact same features, still has the axis lock, which I really like. It's a really nice, easy to operate one-handed blade. Uh, you don't have to worry about having two hands to close that up. You just hit the axis and close it up and it's good to go. Uh, also Benchmade, uh, you can get replacement parts for them. So if you tear up the clip, you lose screws, that kind of thing, then you can buy a replacement. So I always have some type of knife on me. Next up, this is a flashlight from Tac Lights. Uh, it's one of the many that I carry. I've got a couple of smaller Surefires that I'll carry as well. Uh, Tac Lights is a small flashlight manufacturer. They're a custom flashlight manufacturer. And this is made in the USA. It's machined here. Um, really nice setup. It has a rechargeable cell inside of it, so I don't have to worry about burning up CR123s all the time. And it has uh, three stages of light. It's not the greatest defensive flashlight because you have to toggle through three stages. Uh, you can't just go from dim to bright, and you don't just have the bright when you fire the flashlight up. Uh, but as a general purpose light, it has a really nice low stage and medium stage for utility work, and then it does still have a full-on high beam that you can use for searching or for tactical applications. Uh, really nice light. Uh, it's got a bezel that will allow it to stand up on its own. So you can click it on and you can tail stand it. And if you've ever been uh, inside a uh, residential structure when the power's out, uh, it's lovely to be able to take a flashlight and shine it against a white ceiling and just sit it down like that because it'll light up the whole room. Uh, that's a technique I actually use fairly often when I'm working, but it's nice to have access to that when you're not. Also, it has crenellated edges on both sides, so you can use it as an impact weapon if you run into a situation where a less lethal weapon uh, is really more useful than a knife or a firearm. Always carry a flashlight on you. It may be broad daylight, you go inside of a structure, say you're in the local Walmart or you're in a warehouse somewhere and the power goes out. Uh, it's really nice to be able to have one of these. If there's a fire, it's gonna kill the breakers. You're gonna run into situations where there may be darkness. Being able to grab a light and find an exit may be the difference between life or death. Now, like I said, just about any time I'm out and about, flashlight, knife, and phone are on me. Now we're gonna start talking about a couple of the different firearms that I carry. Now the first gun I'm gonna talk about here that I carry off duty is this Keltec 
P3AT. Uh, before we get into handling each one of these, I'm going to tell you uh, we're not working the slides, we're not making sure they're clear because all of these are actually loaded right now. They're all hot, they all have one in the pipe, so we are obeying the primary firearms commandment and we're treating every weapon as if it were loaded. Uh, these are always loaded in my house because I constantly rotate through these guns depending upon the situation and it really tears up your ammo to constantly unload and load and it tears up your magazines to constantly unload and load. Leaving magazines loaded is perfectly fine. Uh, keeping that spring compressed is perfectly fine. Cycling springs over and over again is what wears them out. So we leave these loaded. We're going to treat these as loaded. I'm not going to be pulling the trigger. I'm not going to be cycling the slide. We're just going to talk about the individual guns. So back to the P3AT. This is my gun to carry when I wouldn't normally carry a gun gun. Uh, basically, if I'm going into a situation where I think that there is no chance whatsoever that I would actually need to defend myself with a firearm, this is the gun I take. I never want to be totally unarmed because God forbid something actually happens, someone gets killed, and I made a conscious choice not to carry a firearm. That's something I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. I have the ability to carry a firearm. If I don't need it, it's not a big deal. If I need it, I better have one. So this is the one I take with me if I think there's absolutely no chance that I'm going to need a firearm. Uh, it is the perfect size to stick in a pocket holster and drop in your pocket. It disappears in a cargo pocket. Uh, depending upon the jeans I have, I can actually put this in my front slash pants pocket and not even know it's there. It fits great in coat pockets. And the really cool thing about this gun in this holster, again, depending upon the pants you wear, is if you do run into a situation where you think you may need it, you can access the gun, you can take a firing grip on it with your hand in your pocket without anyone actually knowing. And it doesn't look strange to have your hand in your pocket. That's what pockets are made for, right? I know some of you military guys will disagree with me. We were never allowed to actually use our pockets. But in civilian clothes, sticking your hands in your pockets is uh, pretty normal. So if you run into a situation that makes you feel uncomfortable or think you may have to have to, you may have to access a firearm quickly, uh, you can stick your hand in your pocket, you can stage the weapon, get a good firing grip, and you know you're ready to go. Uh, this P3AT is also equipped with a clip. Uh, it's a really simple spring metal clip, just like I have on my knife. So if I'm going running, I can clip this inside the waistband of my running shorts and it'll stay there just fine. Uh, if I don't want a pocket carrier, I'm wearing jeans that maybe the pockets don't work for that, uh, then I can slide this in my waistband and clip it in there. The P3AT has an extremely long double action trigger pull and it is double action only. So this gun for most instances is safe to carry without a holster. You have to pull the trigger through three quarters, almost a full inch of travel uh, before the weapon will fire. Uh, just a little short tug on it will not cause it to fire, unlike the Glocks. I do like the P3AT because there are no external safeties, there are no external controls to it. It is just simply a trigger and it does have a magazine release, although this is one of the few guns that I do not generally carry a spare magazine for. Uh, and again, it is small, it's light, single stack, 380, it disappears. I carried this gun in a tux one night, uh, clipped in my waistband behind my cummerbund, and no one knew I was carrying it at all. My wife was the only one that knew I was carrying it because I was dancing with her. Uh, no one else knew I was carrying it. In fact, uh, it happened to be a law enforcement event and one of the other people there uh, made the comment that, uh, see, I wasn't carrying a gun and I asked her, what makes you think I'm not carrying a gun? Uh, so really, really nice low profile gun if you don't think you're gonna need one. Now the next up from this is probably the gun that I, get the most use out of and this is my Glock 26 uh, again it's a 9 millimeter it is a double stack it carries 10 in the magazine and we always keep one in the pipe so we have 11 rounds in it and with this I usually do carry a spare magazine so it's another spare 10 round magazine now carrying spare magazines is something that people sometimes 
get complacent about that. I will not always carry the spare magazine on me. Uh, sometimes it is in my bag in the car with the rest of my stuff, but uh, if you have the ability to do so and you can do so without uh, causing any issues with concealment, carry a spare magazine. Uh, the reason for that is you may have a mechanical failure in your primary magazine, need to ditch it, and then you need to put a spare magazine in. Just regular tap rack bang may not clear your problem. So you don't carry a spare magazine because you think you're gonna need 21 rounds to put down a threat. You carry a spare magazine because you may get to your second round and find out that there's a catastrophic problem with that primary magazine. Now the Glock 26, I really like it because overall it is a fairly light handgun, but it still affords me almost a full grip and the controls are exactly like the handgun that I carry for work and exactly like the handgun that I shoot in competition. So everything works exactly the same. Uh, the trigger pull is very, very similar between the gun I carry for work and the gun I shoot in competition. Uh, the sights are the same. So everything just works. Uh, people will get into the 9mm, 40 caliber, 45, the stopping power debates, but the reality of the situation is 9mm shooting full power defensive hollow points is more than enough to take care of any situation that you're going to encounter. Uh, it's your responsibility to train with this weapon system so that you can put the shots where they need to go to do an instant incapacitation, but you don't need to get all wrapped around it. Uh, Glock does make the 27, which is the same gun in 40 caliber. They make a slightly chunkier Glock 30, which is a double stack 45, and they make the Glock 36, which is a single stack 45. I am a big fan of Glocks because they are just dead reliable guns. And again, it's what I carry at work, so the skills transfer over, there's no relearning anything. Now with the Glock, because you do have a short striker fired trigger pull, you do need to carry something that actually covers the trigger guard. Now this is a holster from Aegis Armory, and we'll leave a link to this down in the description below. Uh, they sent us this holster a while back and we uh, did a little bit of a review on it. I've been carrying this holster for quite a bit. Um, the only gripe that I have about this holster at all are the metal spring clips. They tend to be a little bit sharp. Uh, but other than that, I can put this holster on, and because it has a leather backing to it and a polymer front, uh, it's very comfortable to wear. I don't get the sweating that I do with some of the full polymer holsters, and it's just a really nice, comfortable setup. Uh, one other thing that you will notice on this is there's this little hook down here on the floor plate. Because I carry this kind of when I don't really want to bulk up with my clothing. I can carry this handgun concealed with just a t-shirt and jeans. I don't want a big, long uh, grip extension hanging out, and that causes my pinky to hang off the bottom of the grip. Well, this is a floor plate from a company called Concealable Control. I got this uh, quite a few years ago. In fact, it's almost a decade ago now. Uh, I'm going to have to find out if they still manufacture these. If so, we'll leave a link down below. But this neat little hook allows me to get those first two fingers uh, hooked on the grip, and the pinky will just float there. But when I fire the handgun, when it recoils, my fingers will not slip off the bottom of the grip because of that little hook. Uh, it works really, really well and allows me to fire this handgun quickly and accurately uh, with the short magazine on it. Now, if you are in a situation where you can conceal it a little bit easier, you can put the longer magazine on there, and now I can actually get a full firing grip. However, I'm of the mindset that if you are gonna go with a longer magazine, why not go with something like a Glock 19 magazine with a uh, base plate on it so that you can actually get the added capacity over the 10 round magazine. But uh, this was one of the magazines this handgun came with. I bought this used ages ago, and it came with the grip extension. This is actually a share extension already on it. So just something to think about there. Um, this handgun is equipped with Trigicon night sights. Actually, I take that back. These are Ameriglow night sights on this one. Uh, they are tritium night sights, so they will glow no matter what until they're... Uh, their radiation has expired uh, once the tritium gas uh, 
degrades to a certain extent, it will no longer glow. Uh, these have been on here again for almost 10 years and they are just now getting to the point where I may start considering replacing them. Uh, however, it is not a primary combat handgun, so I, I've kind of put that off a little bit. Usually, uh, five to ten years is about all you're going to get out of night sights and still have them glow really well. Uh, that is going to depend upon the different night sight manufacturers, though. But I do prefer to have tritium night sights on anything above the pocket guns. Uh, just because they don't take up any extra space, they don't cause any other problems, and if you need to pick up those sights to take a more precise shot, they're there. So that is the Glock 26, and really, I carry the Glock 26 in most situations where I would normally carry a concealed handgun. Um, it gets used a whole lot more than the pocket gun because I know I can fight with this handgun. Uh, I know I can fight multiple aggressors if I needed to with the handgun, but yet it's still low profile enough that I can go about my daily routine and no one knows it's there. Now the next handgun I'm going to talk about is right here. This is the handgun that I take if there is the possibility of encountering trouble. Uh, if I am traveling, this is the handgun that I will generally carry with me when I'm going on cross-country trips. Um, if I am going out late at night, if I have to go through our uh, high drug and crime areas in town, uh, if I have to go do something in uh, plain clothes, kind of an off-duty capacity, but I'm having to go down to the station for work or to pick something up or any of that nature, this is what I carry. Uh, this is a Gen 4 Glock 17. Uh, it's a full-size combat handgun for all intents and purposes. There is the Glock 34, which has a slightly longer barrel, but the grip is still the same size. I really like the Gen 4 Glocks. I know it's a love-or-hate relationship with some people. The reason I like them is the new texture that Glock has put on the Gen 4s. Uh, it doesn't really tear your stuff up, but you can really lock your hand in here. You don't have to have the grip stippled or anything like that. Uh, these uh, little squares just really bite into your hand and lock the handgun in. The real big thing that I like about the Gen 4 Glock 17 is the replaceable back strap here. Without the back strap on it, it is a really small, minimal grip. So if there are ladies out there and you have smaller hands, or if there's guys out there with smaller hands, then the Gen 4s without the back strap are really nice and slim as double stack grips go. Now, I don't have small hands. I've got they're actually size large hands. I wear size large gloves and I don't have any problems uh, gripping a double stack 45. So I went ahead and I put the medium back strap on here, which the medium back strap on a Gen 4 equates to the same size as the grip on the Gen 3s. But the advantage you get here is this medium back strap has a beaver tail on it. So much like a 1911, I can come up in here and I can get a very high grip and pull down and it locks that beaver tail right into the web of my thumb. Now what that does for me when I grab the handgun and I lock my grip in is when the handgun recoils, it doesn't have room for that muzzle to flip up. So the handgun recoils straight back into my hand. And when locked in with my support hand, it's got nowhere to go except straight back. And it really keeps that muzzle down, allows me to really control the handgun well. So I really, really like that back strap. Now it also serves double purpose if I just have to grab that handgun, I don't get a really good grip on it. I don't have to worry about my hand riding up and getting bit by the slide. I don't have to worry about fouling the slide because that uh, back strap is going to keep me down where I need to be on the grip. Now the one complaint everybody has about the Gen 4s is the trigger on it. Well, I fixed that here. This has got a Vogel Competition trigger from Glock Triggers on it. Now don't initially discount it because it says it is a competition trigger. Uh, it is all Glock parts. They have been polished and they've been tuned and there are some proprietary springs in there. So it does lighten the trigger pull, makes the trigger pull very, very smooth. I'm not going to say it's a 1911 trigger pull, but it is the best Glock trigger that I have ever used. 
Um, it was designed for world-class IDPA shooters, so uh, it really is a nice trigger. Now, Glock Triggers is the same company that makes the Haley Strategic Skimmer Trigger, and that is designed to be a carry trigger. Uh, this is just a little bit higher level than that. And again, designed to be a competition trigger, but we put probably about 2,000 rounds through this handgun with that trigger in and not had a single problem at all. Now, when I turn it over here, you'll notice it has the factory slide stop on it. It has the factory magazine release on it. Again, the Gen 4s have a little bit larger magazine release than the Gen 3s. It's not, it doesn't stick out any further. It's just a larger paddle altogether. Now, the reason I haven't put any added accessories on here is because I am a right-handed shooter. I carry this handgun on my right-hand side. I don't like extended mag releases because if that handgun gets hit, there is the possibility of my body disengaging the magazine release and having my magazine pop out on me. A uh, very bad situation because it may just pop out that much, which is enough to hold it in when you draw, but as soon as you fire that first shot, it's going to come out. So not a good situation to be in. So I don't like extended magazine releases. I'm just fine hitting the magazine release from almost a full firing grip. I have to rotate just a little to hit it cleanly, but it's no problem at all. The slide stop, the same thing is true there. I take a very, very high grip with my support side hand and running an extended slide stop on here or anything that sticks out will cause me to ride that slide stop and the slide will usually go home on an empty magazine if I have any kind of extended slide stop at all. Uh, with this one, I do not have that problem at all. I don't think I've ever had this fail to lock back on an empty magazine with the factory slide stop on there. I did try one of the G34 the competition model slide stops, which just has a little triangle sticking out on it, and that did occasionally cause me to drop the slide on an empty magazine. Uh, so you need to make sure that you take your handguns out and you try that stuff out and uh, see what works and what doesn't work. Now you'll notice right here, this is the holster that I used to carry a handgun when it's in this condition. This is a Kydex holster from Raven Concealment, and it is a really nice outside the waistband holster. It's got just the regular plastic belt loop option on it, and it has the full sweat guard up here. I really like the full sweat guard on an outside the waistband holster like this because it protects all those controls that we were talking about. In fact, it comes out enough that there is even the possibility that it would protect from hitting an extended magazine release if you chose to run one. But it also makes it a whole lot easier to reholster this handgun because you're not fighting the inside lip and you're not fighting your clothing. It's less likely that you're going to get a shirt hooked and push something down into there. And that's one of the primary causes of negligent discharges with Glocks, is if you get clothing or something jammed in that trigger guard when you go to holster up, then you can depress the trigger and you can have a problem. So you need to make sure that you have everything clear of that holster when you go to holster back up. Now, being an outside the waistband holster, I don't have to worry about the width of the weapon, so I can carry the weapon light on it just fine. And I really, really like having the weapon light attached to this thing if I'm going somewhere that there may be trouble that I may have a high chance of needing to draw my weapon. Uh, the weapon light just allows you to take a nice solid firing grip. You don't have to try to juggle flashlight and handgun at the same time. Uh, I train with weapon lights. I train in low light, so operating them is second nature to me. And just really, I, I can't say enough about having a weapon light on your handgun, especially in a home defense situation. You don't have to try to find where your flashlight is. You don't have to hope the kids or the wife didn't grab it to go find something underneath the refrigerator. Um, it's always on the handgun. If you keep it in a holster like this, it's always protected. It's always ready to go. So I really like that. Now in this rig, I also carry two spare magazines. Since this is a Glock 17, it gives me 17 rounds in the magazine. It gives me one in the chamber for 18 rounds on the gun and two spare 17 round magazines. 
Now, again, it's not because I think I'm going to go out and I'm going to encounter that many threats that need to be neutralized. Uh, that's really not realistic. What is realistic, though, is that Murphy creeps into your magazines while you're sleeping and you go fire that first shot, you have a problem. Uh, maybe it was a bad day at the Glock factory and you've got a second magazine hiding in there somewhere that's got a bad spring in it or uh, you happen to get your competition magazines or your practice magazines mixed in with your carry magazines and you got a really beat up mag in there. Uh, just the ability to have that sparrow when your life is on the line is a whole lot more important to me than the extra added bulk of a tertiary magazine instead of just carrying a secondary. Uh, again, not a big deal because we're carrying an outside the waistband holster. Now you do need to make sure you have a nice solid leather belt or a solid synthetic belt to support this stuff. But another added advantage that I found with carrying two magazines on my support side is it helps balance out the handgun and the weapon light on my strong side. And you can actually carry a whole lot more weight on your body when it's balanced than you can when you create an imbalance. Create an imbalance in your body and day after day after day that can actually cause injuries. So balancing things out is a whole lot better. And I find I really, once I put everything on with a good belt, since the load is kind of equalized, I don't really notice the fact that I'm carrying two magazines on my support side. So that is the Raven Concealment Rig and the Glock. Now, since the Surefire X300 is quick on, quick off, I can just pull that off if I think it's a situation where I'm not going to need the weapon light, I'm not going to need all the extra magazines. You know, if it's really something that I just kind of want to go low profile, but I still want to have a full size handgun with me, then I grab this guy. And it is a Compact Minotaur. It is a really, really neat holster. And it has this uh, synthetic, uh, kind of hard plastic outer molded deal and then it has belt clips and it has a really nice high quality leather uh, inside backer to the holster. Now the Minotaurs, the interesting thing about these is Comptac actually made these to be modular so you can buy additional outer shells and if you have several different handguns that you rotate through you can actually take the screws out and swap these outer shells and keep the same hangers and the same backer if you're trying to save some money. I kind of think that's a lot of hassle. Uh, if I was using a Minotaur for several different handguns, I'd just buy the Minotaur for those handguns. But it has some nice abilities to set it up. The tension is adjustable on it. Uh, these belt clips are excellent. They allow me just to grab this thing. I can feed the little ends down into my pants, jam this between my uh, side and my belt, and clip it over the belt and I'm really good to go. It's a wonderful inside the waistband holster. This is quite possibly the most comfortable inside the waistband holster that I have ever used. I can't say enough about the Comptac Minotaur. It is really, really an awesome holster. Now as far as spare magazines go when I'm carrying this rig, uh, usually I will just take a spare magazine and I will either throw it in my pocket or again, I'll just throw it in my bag uh, with me. I'm really trying to go low profile when I grab this rig so I don't go with external mag carriers or anything. With uh, extra large t-shirts that are not athletic cut, I can conceal this rig in jeans and a t-shirt. So again, it is a really, really nice setup. The only complaint that I have about the Comptac Minotaur is the uh, outer plastic here. Uh, is a little bit flexible and even when you crank these down you don't get a lot of retention with it. Uh, that's not a big deal though because the retention actually comes when you tighten your belt down and your pants down around the outside of it. Since this isn't inside the waistband holster your belt is really what is going to control the tension and it is really nice with this holster to be able to come back inside the house. I can unclip it, I can throw it in my desk drawer, I can throw it back in the safe. Uh, it's quick on, quick off and if I'm traveling with this thing, it's really great to be able to slip on when you're jumping out of the car and not have it jamming you in the side uh, the whole time you're in the car on a you know three, four hour drive. So that is the bare minimum of what I will carry when I go out for different levels. Yeah, I even hesitate to call it a threat assessment because it's just a general idea that, okay, I'm going here, I probably won't need a gun or I'm going here um, just 
no idea what's going on and I take the regular handgun or possibility of a high threat situation where I take the, the heavier gun. Now I'm going to emphasize something here with all this stuff. Uh, common sense tells you if you know there's going to be a gunfight, stay home. Don't go there. Even with all this stuff, if I know there's going to be a problem, I don't go there. I let the guys that are working, that are in uniform at that time, deal with it. Um, but I always carry a gun because you don't want to have that day when you go drop the kids off at school. And that happens to be the day that one of the teacher's crazy ex-husbands decides to come make a point and shoot the school up. Uh, that's the day that I want to hopefully be carrying this rig and be able to deal with the problem versus carrying this one. So you need to decide what you encounter in your daily life and you need to gear up accordingly. Uh, every situation you run into, this isn't going to be appropriate. Uh, it's difficult to conceal when I'm just wearing a t-shirt. I usually have to wear a jacket or a button-up shirt or something of that nature, untucked, something that flows a little bit over this rig. Uh, otherwise it prints. And if it prints, if somebody knows you're carrying a handgun, it's going to draw fire on you first. So bear that in mind. Uh, we talked about open carry versus concealed carry before on the show. Uh, my argument in my daily life is I want to go concealed as much as humanly possible because I don't want to have to deal with things. I want to have the choice if I'm going to act or the choice to walk away because there are plenty of situations that you encounter that are not gun situations. They're interpersonal situations that those two people need to work out and it's not something I need to be involved in. Or it's a situation where it's a whole lot better for me just to stand back to observe, to be a witness, and wait for the uniformed guys to come handle it. Concealed gives me that option. Whereas if you're carrying exposed, that either pens me as a cop, security, somebody that needs to do something about a situation. And it may suck you into something that either you're not equipped to deal with at the time, you don't have the capacity to deal with, or you're with your kids and your family, and it will be a security risk to them for you to deal with it. So bear that in mind if it's legal in your area and you're trying to decide if you're gonna go concealed or open carry. I'm not gonna tell you it's wrong either way. It's a personal choice that you have to make. Well, that's about it. My sinuses have about filled up. I think I've reached the end of my capacity to talk about this stuff, but I hope you guys have gotten an idea and gotten a little bit out of this and maybe it'll help you with uh, deciding what you're going to do. Now, obviously not everybody has uh, this many options. If you had to select a single option for an average guy going about your day to day, I would highly suggest looking into the Glock 26 or a 9mm 45 of this size. It's just really a handy handgun to have for just about any situation where you would need a defensive firearm. And it's got the capacity and the ability to handle most problems that you're going to run into. That's it for this week. If you guys have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments section below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you like this video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And we're still working on the Ma 10 build series. Look for the next one of those videos to come out a little bit later this week. Until next time, get out and shoot!